welcome everybody, hearty souls. Thank you for coming out in this terrible weather. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to review the significant and unprecedented damage uh, that we sustained in July storms, just a, a kind of a review. And we really want to explain why we need, may need to potentially borrow some um, money. So thank you for coming tonight. We're gonna go through the slide deck um, and then open it up for questions. So thank you very much. Okay, so you got the second slide up. So just a brief recap of why the five million figure was arrived at. Um, on July 22nd, we toured all of the damage areas in town with the, uh, John Pachorek, who's our emergency management director, and a couple of representatives from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. And through the course of that day and uh, discussions with them, we reported that we had 4.7 million in, in emergency repairs that we were aware of during that period of time. Um, so emergency spending has to be paid for by the end of the year, the fiscal year in which it occurs. That's to keep us on a balanced budget. Um, and if I say anything that's not quite correct, um, yeah, we'll uh, please yeah, we'll chime in, Brenda um, <laughs> okay. and Casey. And um, so to ensure that you know, we have the ability to pay for this storm damage, we, are asked, we asked the residents uh, at a special town meeting to approve allowing us to borrow up to you know, the, 15, or the $5 million that we thought we might need. Um, that was approved, and then the, the town in this round of, uh, Natalie Blay, our, our representative is here, she and Joe Comerford, our senator, have been working really hard with the state. To, in fact, I think they were one of the reasons why the state actually even set aside 15 million to help towns like us was because of their efforts. So I really want to recognize those efforts. <laughs> and uh, so finally, um, this is what I want people to understand. If we don't have the need to borrow money, we certainly are not going to borrow money. But I think of this as an insurance policy if we need the money and we need to find a way to amortize this emergency debt over a period of years, we would work with the town accountant and the treasurer and the town administrator to do this in the most financially, or the least expensive way. I don't ever envision that we would do this like a home mortgage where you borrow a lump sum for a period of time. This would be targeted short-term borrowing so that we could pay down the debt over three to five to seven years, um, but we would have met the requirements of the state. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Bacharik, and he's going to talk you through some, some of the storm damage we experienced and some of the things that uh, we did to mitigate that. Good. So first, let's jump over to the first slide. I think the select board is going to run through uh, some of the dates with us, and then uh, I'll jump right in. Uh, July 10th, that we had heavy rainfall that pushed the Deerfield River over the flood stage, causing major crop damage in the farmlands, inundating the north end of town, and causing stormwater to back up across Greenfield Road in the Wapping Road area. Stillwater Bridge closed Monday to Thursday for MassDOT to conduct a safety inspection. This was river flooding. So Six short days later, we got hit again with torrential rains, causing extensive flooding along Bloody Brook. The roadways and infrastructure failed through, uh, throughout North Deerfield. Asphalt was severely damaged in many areas, including Stillwater Road, River Road, and Pine Nook Road. Access to Conway was cut off uh, along Route 116. Significant washouts occurred on dirt roads throughout town. Yeah, so this video just shows you the, the flooding that we've become accustomed to around Richardson's. Now on July 21st, sorry, I, I don't have the ability to read this. On July 21st, 
before we could repair the, the damage that occurred on the 16th, uh, we got hit with eight inches of rain in 53 minutes, which is an amazing amount of water. And it washed away the partially completed repairs that we had started. It caused huge washouts on Hawks Road, Hoosick Road, Lower Road, where a whole section of roadway dropped 40 feet. Matthews Road, McClellan Farm Road, Pine Neck Road, River Road, Stillwater Road, and other places that we aren't gonna list here. And this is up near Keats Road into town. Thank you for the select board. For those that don't know me, whether you're watching it tonight, tomorrow, in the future, my name is John Pachork. I'm the chief of police in Deerfield. Just over 11 years now as chief and uh, 30 years in law enforcement last November 1st. The town also appointed me as the emergency management director. Most days, fortunately, some days, unfortunately. So we all know what we're seeing today is an entirely different world than 10, 20, 30 years ago. I'm never going to debate where that's coming from. All right. That's in its own world right now. But what I'm going to tell you is it's crystal clear. We are getting more frequent and dramatically more intense storms. Our infrastructure is aging. It cannot entirely handle the volume and the intensity of the water flow through it. So on the back side of this, what you're going to see is we are updating and upgrading infrastructure in the most cost effective manner possible. When an emergency transpires, when we get one of these events, the first thing that happens is an assessment for public risk, public life. Myself, the highway superintendent, who's amazing, Kevin Scarborough, the fire chiefs, EMS director, the select board, we establish an emergency management working group and we assess our access to all residents in town. We make sure we can get an ambulance, a fire truck, no matter what, to those locations. We knew July was really bad. July 16th, we had no idea July 21st was coming. When I was sitting in Old Deerfield at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was with John Cocott from Cocott Construction on Wapping Road, figuring out our fix for July 16th. I left there at 2.07. I got back to my office, it was sunny. I heard Conway calling for flooded basements, flooded basements, flooded basements, flooded basements, and I went, oh God, really, yeah, that sells right to the west of us. Within 10 minutes, they called us on the radio and said, you have water across the road at Richardson's. And I literally turned to my administrative assistant and said, I just left there, no there's not. So I started up north on five and 10. I got to Child's Crossroad, just north of the Butterfly Museum. I was at 10 miles an hour with my wipers on high and I could barely see. It was an absolute wall of water. I had residents in Old Deerfield tell me that with a wheelbarrow that was empty, it was full on the backside of the storm. Some residents estimated that we got 5.5 inches of water in 53 minutes. Some residents estimated I got one report at 10.25. The water was running off of mountainsides like rivers where it's never even run before. It, it just doesn't come off there. It literally looked like rivers. It was unbelievable. We immediately went into a damage assessment mode for risk of safety and lives, figuring out where we needed to go, what we needed to do. We pulled the working group into the police station conference room that evening at 8 p.m. Kevin Scarborough and I started calling, excuse me for the dry mouth, a, an entire list of contractors. So now let's think about this. We're, we're mid to late July, no contractors even available. Anybody that has excavators, they plan their season in March, April. So Friday night, we were so fortunate to lock in Davenport Construction because Pine Nook Road was absolutely decimated. The entire drainage was either plugged, destroyed by large rocks moving down that road. The stream bed, as you'll see in the slides when we get there, 
was entirely full of debris. The stream actually transitioned to a river onto the roadway. The roadway was the river. It had washed down at the base right before the underpass where there's a drainage under the railroad trestle with 7.4 feet of debris, silt, and rock that we had to dig out. The working group went into an emergency mode Friday night, 8 p.m. Ben Clark was there, the entire group of us, uh, select board, and it was decided that we immediately, Saturday morning, had to get contractors in there to reopen certain roads. Matthews Road, we know, was completely cut off to Conway. We know 116 was cut off to Conway. People were asking, how do we get home? We said, you can try 91 North, Route 2 West to 112 South, but I can't even promise you you can get home that way. Well, when will you have the road open? I don't have an answer for you. What do you mean you don't have an answer? I, I don't have an answer for you. I have roads that are completely gone. There are literally 30 to 70 foot drop-offs on the side of the road that are showing. Thankfully, on Saturday, Cocot Construction was able to come in with a full working crew, meet us at Yankee Candle um, Corporation, Corporate Center on Yankee Candle Drive, meet with Kevin at about 8 o'clock in the morning. 6.50 in the morning, Davenport Construction showed up with several pieces of machine and personnel and was on da uh, Davenport was on Pine Nook Road. So Kevin was with Davenport at 6.50, Cocot's at 8 a.m., and they were off and moving to at least get emergency access to the entire town of Conway. Get emergency access to not only Eagle Brook, but our few residents that do reside up on Pine Nook Road. So for us, this literally was a traumatic event for the town. It was a traumatic event for all the responders as well. We all know, I think, what Ben Clark went through with uh, the car going down into a river in front of him. So let's start progressing through the slides. Let's take a peek at the damage. And then on the back side of this, the select board's going to discuss some of the finance numbers. And we certainly will open the floor to any questions. We're happy to answer any questions. But I think the biggest takeaway tonight that you're going to hear from the select board is there's no intent to spend any money that we don't absolutely have to. That is the takeaway tonight. All right, so Chris, let's start ripping right through. Stillwater Road, as we came up there, you'll notice the entire road collapsed. What water does at this, uh, when it infiltrates any vulnerable area at this amount of velocity is it erodes the base underneath everything. And that's where you see this whole rippling effect with the road. It did it in several locations with us. It actually took storm debris down from the mountainside and actually shoved it under the pavement, creating the ripple effects with the rock. So we know Stillwater Road had to be repaired. There was a couple culverts on that road that had collapsed that had to be re repaired as well. For those that don't know what culverts are, because I had to learn this too from police mode versus emergency management director. Culverts are merely a pipe that goes under the road that allows water to drain. That's it. So when I reference a culvert, that's what I'm speaking about. When we flip over to Matthews Road, we had four damaged locations that the road completely washed away. So when John Cocott went up there on the 22nd on Saturday morning, he had the truck in materials, bring the excavators up there and start backfilling that with rock and rebuilding the slopes so we could get cars by. Within, I believe, five or six hours, we had one travel lane open. By the end of the day, by 6 p.m., we had borderline two travel lanes open. Cocot construction was amazing. Mm -hmm. Flipping over to Hoosack Road. Hoosack Road on the 16th was destroyed. What you see on the left-hand side is the 16th. What you don't see in these two photos is on the 21st, it was exacerbated probably three times this distance. It took the entire road out and it pulled the pipe and pushed the pipe right downstream. That entire area later on you will see 
has been fully rebuilt and it was reopened late last week thanks to Kevin Scarborough. Flipping over through Hussack Road, we have the opening photo right there. Good, perfect. So right on the bottom, you'll see the brand new guardrails. You'll see the road has been repaired and we don't have a picture of the head walls. That pipe was upgraded from a 36 inch size pipe to a 60 inch pipe. Those allow for a 700% greater water flow. Seven times. I don't think we'll be back there anytime in the near future, and even we, with the intense storms. We've done that with, with everything that we've replaced too, not just going back in with what's there. We, you know, oversized, every, got in as big as we could get to handle the amount of water that's coming through. So John will hit on a lot of that too. Yeah, so our goal anytime we got into a location was to increase for future storm damage capacity so long as one thing did not exist, infrastructure downstream. Because there is a point that you do want to culvert as a choke point to slow the velocity down, and we don't want to create havoc on somebody's house or a roadway downstream where we just don't want that velocity. So... Trevor's spot on, everywhere we could increase, we did increase for future storm damage capacity, so hopefully we're not back there in the next 50 to 60 years. Lower Road. Lower Road had several damage locations. Most notably, uh, people know just north of Savage Farms, 138 Lower Road, where the road completely washed out. You have a water line exposure here. Thankfully, that water line did not go. Uh, it stayed intact the whole time. Uh, we had uh, an amazing water superintendent up at Old Deerfield Forever that maintains stuff well, that's kind of sitting in the back row up there. So this had to be rebuilt. We had to go out and look at three bids ultimately to do this. And uh, Mass West did it. They rebuilt it with a 60 inch pipe with new head walls on the next page. Chris can flip over for you. You'll see that that road's been repaved, reformed, restructured, and guardrails in place. What we found with that road is that was initially a box culvert. A box culvert years ago, 60, 80, 100 years ago, they used to pour cement block culverts. When they failed 40 to 50 years ago, they would jam a metal pipe through. Kevin didn't know that. I didn't know that until we started digging. You couldn't see that old infrastructure until we exposed it. And it was evident all across town. If you look at Richardson's right on the corner, right where the choke point is for the water, right where there's usually four feet of water and it buries one or two cars, a good storm for me. Insurance companies don't like us. Right there. That was a 44 by 48 box culvert. When it failed, the largest pipe they could stick through there, probably 40 to 50 years ago, was a 30 inch steel pipe that had fully corroded. So we went from 44 by 48 in the early 1900s, because that was the old five and 10, down to a 30 inch inlet. And then we wondered why, why the water keep backing up? Why, why, why is the water backing up? That pipe was upgraded from a 30 broken metal pipe to a 60. Lower road. One of the problems we had with today's uh, infrastructure is it was built anywhere from 80 to 120 years ago, where the most cost-efficient construction was next to rivers and streams. I want you to think about 116 towards Conway. The whole way you're going up through the S corners is all along a stream bed. The most cost-effective way to put in roads years ago was to follow those. Because naturally near the stream bed, you would have some flat and low points that you wouldn't have to cut out much rock and do a lot of blasting. The problem with today with these more frequent and intense storms is those waterways can't hold the water within their banks. That holds true for Lower Road. It parallels the Deerfield River. The water came off of Lower Road with such velocity that it washed out the edges of the road and you almost have to get out of your car and stop and walk 
and take a peek where you see brand new rock on the side of the road. Because when you look over the bank, over the guardrails that you can't see from driving your car, and you see a 60-foot drop that we had to backfill, then you start to go, oh, God, I kind of understand what they were dealing with. You can't see it as well when you're just driving a car. You, you can't see over the edge of the road. So that's lower road. I think we had three points that were between 30 to 60, 65 feet, and they are very substantial if you ever just want to throw your hazards on and take a peek over the bank up there. Flip it over to Pine Nook. I think Pine Nook got hit the worst. If you actually go back to uh, weather mapping from July 21st, you'll actually see that color coding of the weather goes from red, pink, to white. White indicates five to 10 inches of rain. White sat over Eagle Brook School and over that mountain area for 53 minutes. And it just sat there. After that, it transitioned up to Gill and Irving, where the water was flowing so heavy that the Connecticut River came over Route 2 and they had to shut Route 2 down. Not even talking about the Route 2 storm damage yet, where the bank collapsed, but even before that, at Barton's Cove, the water came totally across Route 2. The road had to be shut down. There was so much rain when it left us. Pine Nook Road, by, by sheer description, was decimated. As I said earlier in the presentation, number one, you have a water line being exposed here that actually did fracture and was totally broken. They had to operate on a backup system with less pressure than I think would be normally there for certain areas. Um, you know, Brian certainly would know that a hundred times better than I would. I don't know the water system well, but I do know we had the water line broken. We had gas lines exposed for several days. Um, other infrastructure exposed for several days. But what we ultimately lost was the road itself and all the drainage through there. All the drains on one side of the road, the water, rock, silt and debris got in there so bad that it either collapsed, it was plugged and couldn't be sucked out. We brought Mohawk cleaning in with the big vacuum trucks for two days, could not get the debris out of them. We had to dig that up and put all new drainage in there, all new inlets, new roadway, restructure and rebuild the stream bed push it back over in certain areas 11 feet from where it ended and rebuild the road from top to bottom. That road was anywhere from 30 to 36 inch collapsing metal culverts. What happens when those metal culverts erode at the base and they, um, they totally rust out is the rocks start to pop through underneath, creates friction with the water and it reduces your water velocity through there and ultimately gives you less water flow. So all that was upgraded, all of it was redone on Pine Nook Road. At the base of Pine Nook Road, I mentioned earlier, we had 7.4 feet of debris. I think that's in Chris's slide. If you look not to the far left, but the second picture in from the left, you'll actually see where the edges of the road eroded with such velocity that it took some of the edge of the roadway off, but the debris came from all the way up on the mountainside as well. So Pine Nook Road was a massive challenge for us. I think we had that road closed, if memory serves correct, for 42 days. 42 days Pine Nook Road was closed, unless it was an emergency vehicle access. Switching over to Greenfield Road. John, and like I said, we John, will take questions at the end. Go ahead, Carolyn. I just want to comment that during that closure, um, there was not adequate fire um, protection for almost 10 days because there was not water pressure. So it, if anyone had had a fire in the north end of town, it would have been a, an awful thing because there wasn't um, water. The backup system was not able to produce that kind of water for fire flow.
Thanks, Chris. Good, flipping over to Greenfield Road. Uh, Greenfield Road was decimated in a couple locations. We know it parallels um, the mountain area where that cell kind of hovered over, along with Keats Road. Pine Nook, Keats Road, Wapping Road, 5 and 10, that area, Matthews Road, Hawks Road, Hoosack Road, Lower Road, all got hammered, the worst, worst of the bunch. Um, you can certainly see by the video, the water, the velocity. Up in that top middle slide, if you look right below the guardrail, there should be a metal pipe showing in that middle slide. I don't know if you can see that metal pipe in the bottom right-hand corner. That's a 10-inch gas main that's exposed. That's uh, an absolute no-no by any standards. So this entire area had to be rebuilt. We know the water was two feet over the road at Richardson's. The, uh, the neat fact is the backside of Richardson's, right at the corner of, of Wapping Road and Depot Road, by my measurement, the water was about 6.3 feet deep. Good for a good swim if there wasn't a, a current there. So Greenfield Road had to be repaired in several locations. Uh, one of the things that we had to do on our side is to reopen drainage that had not been opened and maintained for 30 to 80 years. And this was not our highway department. This was not the state highway department. This is because we live in a world today that all of us are petrified to remove any storm debris from anywhere that we may consider is a conservation area or a wetland. <laughs> so one of the things I had to do was work closely with not only DEP, but the Conservation Commission as a whole, declaring emergencies, going in and removing storm debris, and reopening drainage that has not been opened in decades. The water is flowing now in Old Deerfield better than it has, I can promise you, in 50 plus years. All of that has only been possible. Thank you to DEP. Thank you to Pete Law from Conservation Commission and the entire Conservation Commission group and our highway superintendent, Kevin Scarborough. What we have completed in repairs, once we work through the final numbers at the end of this presentation, what we have completed in repairs for this town is probably five to 15 times the amount we've spent if we were to do it through engineering, public bid, and go through every legal route, not during an emergency. All the infrastructure, all the work, all the digging, all the opening, we have got it, unfortunately, at a bargain price of massive storm damage. Let's continue to go through so we can open it up for questions. We know Wapping Road has been a nightmare for years. Well, Kevin and I walked through there and we said, okay, what are we gonna do? And I, I told Kevin, we're gonna gut it. And he goes, oh God, we're gonna gut this road from head to tail. Every pipe was upgraded. The sides of the roads were dredged. The water is running where the water is supposed to run even when we got five and a half inches of rain last week, there was nothing even close to the roadway. All the infrastructure was handling it as if it was a half inch rainstorm. And that's what we wanted to see. Everything's been upgraded. Like I said, that 30 inch pipe underneath the lawn that goes out towards five and 10 is now a 60 inch pipe. If that doesn't handle it, I don't know what to tell you, we're in an apocalypse. So Wapping Road, we did spend a little infrastructure money there because everything was decimated, and I think that that is an absolute success. The serious concerns we have right now, let's, uh, let's kinda, that's what we've done to date so far, and the select board will talk about the finances and the numbers associated with it, but let's talk about where we're going from here. Serious concerns about River Road. There's three areas of River Road that we, we had looked at. 717 River Road is up near the Franklin County League of Sportsmen. We, we had brought in an excavator. We had put large rock there. 
We rebuilt the side of the road. I say we, I don't do any of this. This guy does everything, he's amazing. But we as a town put large rock in there. First thing we do when we lose a bank is we start with a hook at the base of the bank. Hook in engineering terms just means we're taking six foot by six foot large rock that most decent dump trucks won't haul because it pounds the absolute hell out of your truck. So you've got to find junk dump trucks that are road legal that these guys aren't afraid to beat up their trucks and haul this large rock in there and put six by six foot massive rock at the base. And then we start filling it in with one or two foot rock. And then as we work our way up re-sloping that 80 degree bank back down to a 45 to 50 degree angle bank, we work our way up with smaller and smaller material laying fabric in between every three to six feet. So when the water uh, permeates it, you don't get any loss of material. 717 is complete. The problem at 717 is I think our excavator was so big to reach down 60 feet that it actually compacted the pavement a little bit. You can't feel it when you're driving your car, but if you stop there and walk it, you'll feel your body tilt so much that we need to peel up that pavement, we need to bring in some material, we need to regrade that road and repave it so it's where it's supposed to be. 717, that's not that bad of a fix. Kevin and I are not worried about a collapse there. Our primary focus is 526 River Road, north and south side. Biggest concern is the south side. The road is slumping on the south side of the bank. And we really need to get in there. We need to establish that hook. We need to restructure the entire area. Um, thankfully, the homeowner that's here tonight, just to the south of it, uh, Miss Ava Gibbs has given us permission to enter through her property as well. So, um, <laughs> No, Linda Dumas. Oh, Linda Dumas, I'm sorry. Yep. Not you, Ava. Yep. Um, I'm sorry, it's Linda. Yep. Be a long way around. Yeah. yeah, you're much further north. So 526 on the south side, we need to get in there right along the stream bed, and we need to do the exact same thing. The problem is a week ago, the weather turned on us, and we had to pause everything. The excavator was coming Monday morning. I think Saturday or maybe Friday, Kevin called him and, and literally looking at the weather and said, okay, between Sunday's storm, Tuesday's storm, like let's cancel until we see a clear week coming. We are monitoring 526 daily, north and south side. We are also actively monitoring 717. River Road, little by little, because it's next to the Connecticut River, it is slumping in a few spots. We're monitoring a couple spots down near Beaver Drive. There's several spots that Kevin and I kind of take a peek at and say, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? So there's several locations that we're monitoring through there. You'll notice on the slides up there that you have a sinkhole and collapsed culvert at 580. 680, you got a, a culvert headwall failure that needs a new headwall. And as I noted earlier at 717, we just need to regrade that roadway. Road's still in need of repair. County Road. County Road's had a large sinkhole for years that's been filled uh, over and over and over again. <clears throat> the downside is during these massive intense events, according to the guys that have been filling it for years, <coughs> is that sinkhole went to about 15 times the size that it was. So it took a little hole and made it massive. When we crawl down the bank, 30, 35 feet deep, and we look up that metal pipe, you can see all the debris in there, but it's down 30, 35, 40 feet. This is not a two-day job where you bring an excavator in, you dig out a pipe and just throw a new pipe in. This is down probably closer to 40 feet. It's pretty deep. So County Road, uh, we got a couple locations there. The biggest one is that sinkhole. It is right at the entrance to... Um, to the mechanical building and maintenance building for Eagle Brook, if you know where that is. And you can actually take a peek at any time. You can drive through there. You'll see a big hole that's been filled in the road and uh, that needs to be dressed. That is imminent. Depot Road. 
Depot Road, for those that don't know, is right off of Pine Nook Road. Right before you go under the underpass to head up towards Eagle Brook, on the right-hand side, there's a little cut road that you can cut over to the backside of Richardson's. That's Depot Road. The bank along the edge of Depot Road, it's pretty much a one-lane road, is entirely collapsing, and it goes down a good 45-plus feet. And it's right up to the road. So we've got to get in there. It's going to be ultimately the same thing as River Road. We've got to bring the large rock in. We've got to re-slope the bank. We've got to, uh, you know, just finesse the entire area with cloth and material and work our way right back up. It's just going to take time. The unfortunate part that we all know is all of this just takes money. But I'm going to leave the finances to the select board. Foxtown Road, we've got to replace a culvert up there. Hawks Road needs major repairs. Hawks Road is a dirt road off of Upper Road, and uh, it gets washed out during major rainstorms, not regular rainstorms. The drainage work up there needs a lot of, a lot of finesse. Um, that's something we're going to peek at this spring, see how uh, Kevin can do it in the most cost-effective manner. He's got some great ideas that he's kind of floating back with the select board. So Hawks Road is absolutely on our radar. If you live up there, I apologize. We just haven't been able to get to it. Um, we're trying to do everything we can and be fiscally responsible in doing so. Little Meadow Road. Little Meadow is currently down to a, a single lane. That's going to need restructuring. Little Meadow Road, for those that don't know, is on the backside of Deerfield Academy. It goes out to the old Deerfield sewer treatment plant. And it has been washing out worse and worse since Irene. But these major storms that all of a sudden the water's coming over the road through that area um, is, is just destroying it. The water was about two and a half to three feet over that road onto the corn crop, folding all the corn over from the first storm. I think it was July 10th, if memory serves correct. So Little Meadow, we're going to have to do some stabilization work there. That can be very expensive. Anytime you get over 100 feet, even during an emergency, anytime, you have to permit it on the backside through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Anything under 100 feet, you don't. So I can't tell you that there's going to be a lot of 95-foot fixes. We are trying to do everything we can in the most cost-effective manner. McClellan Farm Road, there's a, uh, a major sinkhole there that drops down probably close to 40 to 50 feet all the way into the river. Uh, Kevin currently has the road closed, and we had a truck go down there past a road close sign with GPS on Saturday and go right over the bank, in case anybody saw those pictures floating around social media. Old Albany Road, uh, dirt section's impassable. Pleasant Ave, we've got to replace one more drop inlet culvert up there. Rice's Ferry Road is nearly impassable. Uh, that's really an old, unmaintained dirt road that we do need to maintain somewhat for emergency access for brush fires. So Rice's Ferry does need some work. Upper Road, upper road we still need to restore and strengthen some embankments and numerous other roads throughout the town. So major repairs made under the emergency declaration. Stage road, we dropped an inlet in there that failed. Uh, roadway was shimmed. Anytime we talk about shimming a roadway, that just means that we kind of put down a base coat on the road. Hillside road, we had a collapsed culvert replaced with a larger culvert. Keats road repaired extensive erosion and pavement damage up there. Unblocked a culvert at Keats road and Greenfield road. Remember, Keats road parallels Pine Nook and Old Deerfield. That's really where that, that cell just, it didn't move for 53 minutes. It just sat there. Pine Nook Road repaired massive erosion, replaced catch basins, collapsed pipes. Pine, Pine Nook at Keith Cross Road. Keith Cross Road is the backside of Pine Nook. It's the tiny little portion that's a steep hill that's paved. That pavement was getting a little bad, but it wasn't that bad. The water infiltrated it and destroyed it. So there was a culvert at the top that it totally plugged. The water was two and a half feet over the road. Uh, Kevin replaced that with a larger pipe. And then he, uh, they ultimately did a shim coat right down that backside. So all of that looks much better and good for many, many years to come. Lee Road, we had a, a repair of a collapsed culvert inlet at 87. 
Stillwater Road, we had several areas that had to be repaired, one near 230, one near new 90, uh, 193. We had to repave several areas. Most remember Stillwater Road by going up from Stillwater Bridge right at the hill where we saw the, uh, the massive erosion right near Brian and Margaret's house. Grave Street, one of our pipes right on Grave Street collapsed. Grave Street triggers me for a side conversation. This storm on July 21st, the first of two events was 99.9% .9 Old Deerfield, right? The second event that happened 45 minutes later was South Deerfield. South Deerfield didn't see the flooding the way Old Deerfield did. South Deerfield got an inch or two of rain. The Bloody Brook came up to full capacity. It was up, it was flooded, it was ugly. Uh, it collapsed the pipe at, at Grave Street. But one of the things I've heard across town is the South Deerfield residents really didn't see a lot of the storm damage until we posted the video on the Deerfield Police Facebook page about all the storm damage in Old Deerfield, because this storm was primarily based and destroyed the infrastructure in Old Deerfield. South Deerfield kind of got hit by the second wave, but it really, it only failed a couple culverts, and all those were replaced pretty quick. Conway Road, we had uh, some pretty significant erosion as, it, uh, as that cell kind of hovered right at the Conway-Deerfield line. Upper Road at Hawks repaired the roadway. Uh, Deerfield water replaced broken pipes and washed out areas in several locations. Old Main Street, the culverts were all backing up, and I think we reopened that hopefully for the next uh, 30 to 50 years again. And Stage Road is good. Critical culverts that still need to be replaced. I'm just about done, and I'll turn it over to the select board for the finances. Broughton's Pond Road. Broughton's Pond Road goes out. It is the north entrance to the sewer treatment plant. There is a pond that's on the right. There's a pond on the left. The road goes through the middle. The pond on the right, if you go through Broughton's Pond Road, you will notice that on the right-hand side, the water's three and a half feet higher than the left side of the road. If I was an engineer, I would say we have a problem. That's not normal. That tells us you either have a plugged or a collapsed pipe in there. And that pipe has been horrific for years and needs to be replaced. So Broughton Ponds Road is up. Child's Cross Road, we've lost a head wall over there and we need to repair that. County Road, we need to get in there and replace that 40 foot deep collapsed culvert. Cross Street, we've got one culvert to replace over on Cross Street on the back side of Graves that cuts over to Eastern Avenue. Kelleher Drive, We've got some work to do over there. One of those culverts backs up over there and we've got to get in there. We've got to dig that out and make sure we open it up and replace it as needed. Mill Village Road at Boynton Road. When you're going to the dump, anybody that lives on South Deerfield, you're headed to your dump run on Saturday and you notice it's raining out. Right around the condos, right around Boynton Road, the water always comes across the road. On the east side, it gets so high the pipe is tiny, it is 90% blocked, the water comes across the road, it then starts to take the mud with it, and all of a sudden we've got a mud run right across the road. And if you watch next time we get a good rainstorm, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. We've got to dig that area out, we've got to replace that pipe, and we've got to keep the water below the road even during a routine storm. Pine Nook Road, uh, remove undersized culvert, we've got one left to do up there and install a larger one to uh, and handle more intense rain flows. We've got to work with the railroad on that. Uh, that is going under the rail. That is not our financial responsibility. Plain Road, we've got uh, one failing culvert to replace. Steam Mill Road, remove and install a new 30 inch culvert. So Waitley Road, we've got a couple new culverts in inlet basins where there's basically a river going right down the side of the road, eroding the side of the road um, and infrastructure and new, numerous other culverts throughout. So just to shore up you know, my presentation quick, Deerfield's infrastructure challenges are outdated infrastructure, new, more frequent, intense storms. We're getting this debris off the mountainsides because of these intense storms. The storms are more frequent where our vegetation's not growing back and the banks aren't restabilizing. So things are getting clogged, compacted, undersized, and more intense more velocity, 
And Kevin and I are trying to work through this because if you told me when I was offered the job 11 and a half years ago as police chief, I'd be dealing with water in culverts, I would have told you you were insane. But unfortunately, it is what it is. We've got to make the best out of it. And the more cost effective that Kevin and I can be, the select board, the town's emergency management team, the more we can accomplish in other areas. And I know everybody's got their own priorities. I'm not going to get into a political argument. I don't care if you're pro or con library, senior center, or anything else. What I can tell you as the emergency management director is this. We had massive damage we had to respond to. I think we handled it extremely and extraordinarily well. I think we handled it in the most cost-effective manner that is even possible. We have a tad bit more to do, which the select board's gonna to describe to you. It's not even that much. It's not that much. To really get things stabilized and where they should be, the more cost-effective that this guy and this guy are, the more we can give to the other projects or keep our taxes down. Next up, Deerfield weather challenges. Anybody on the select board? Can I, okay. can, can I real quick? Half a second. Good evening, Kevin Scarborough, Highway Superintendent. I'm also Assistant uh, Emergency Management Director. Thank you very much, John. You did a fantastic job. Uh, I'll be honest with you. As far as being the Highway Superintendent, John definitely helped me along. Um, otherwise, you'd probably find me in a rubber room someplace. Um, it was it was an extremely tough season. Um, you know, everybody that came came through, the contractors, the employees. You know, I'd like to um, thank everybody very much. And only one thing: we don't dredge anything; we restore to its original elevations. <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. Um. I just want to say that cumulatively, the damage that we had in the July storms was more than more than 20 years of storms, including Irene, that I've worked through as a select board member. It, it, it's, it was just, it's been overwhelming. Um, we haven't, we're still doing re emergency repairs, and we haven't even gotten into the recovery period where we go out and get grants and try to uh, repair the roads, um, you know, long term. So we don't need to get into the weather challenges. We know we're getting more water. Who ha who has heard of flooding the week before Christmas? Um, again, river flooding. We have river flooding and we have rain flooding. There's two kinds of flooding that happens to us, and there's two different ways to deal with it. And um, and we've just been hit this year. It really has been unprecedented. That word sometimes is really overused, but not in this case. Um, we have millions of dollars long term, but we are trying to um, just get the road stabilized and opened. And I will turn it over to Tim to talk to the budget. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is basically to illustrate um, the situation in Deerfield's budget. The, the tall blue bar is the schools, and it's approximately 70%, depending on whether you include benefits or not, of the town budget. All the rest of these lower things include the police department, uh, the public works department, uh, and the general government, those being sort of the, the main three other components. And then the benefits package at the far end is things like what you pay for um, teacher benefits, health insurance, et cetera. And um, this is to illustrate that almost $11 million goes to the schools. The police department's about 1.4 million. The, the, govern, the general government is about the same size. Maybe it's uh, 1.4, yeah. Uh, DPW is slightly less than that. And we're approximately seven months through the fiscal year. So I give or take a couple of weeks. And so we've spent 60% of the budgets for each of these departments. And even if we close down all of these, we were able to, which we can't, 
all these other departments, it still wouldn't match the amount of money that we had to spend in emergency repairs. Uh, it's, so that's, that's where we're at. And the next, the next graph. So this is, um, the big green bar is approximately $2.11 million worth of repairs that have been completed to date. You've seen the pictures of the damage, and in, in the case of Lower Road, you can see that the work was done by quality contractors uh, and in a very uh, timely manner. Uh, and then we, we project about another 250,000 of things that we that are still related to this emergency storm condition that we need to do. Some of that's the river road in, um, planting the hook that the chief was talking about and um, you know, then reinstalling um, <clears throat> guardrails in, in areas where there are steep banks next to the roadways. So you know, we're, we're not, as you see, close to the $5 million level, but uh, the next, uh, I guess the next, slide that we're, um, we're going to show you is this is what our neighbors in Western Massachusetts experienced. So Conway, $3.8 million of estimated damage. North Adams, $4.7 million, six and a half, yeah, million dollars. Deerfield, 4.7. I think we're the largest number in this Western Mass community. Uh, and statewide, um, I spoke with the or emailed the Rural Affairs Director, Ann Gobi, um, two days ago to find out. There are 40 communities uh, with reported $50 million worth of damage that are competing for $15 million of state aid. And as I said before, it's largely because of the hard work of our representatives and senators that this $15 million is even available. So there are some mitigating factors in large communities. You know, there's the, the administrative Administration and Finance Committee is going to decide how this money gets dispersed and how, when it gets dispersed. But um, so we know that we'll probably get state money, but probably not enough to pay for this uh, money that we've had to put out. And what we're asking for under this debt exclusion is to allow us the ability to borrow to pay for whatever we don't get back from the state so that we can continue to. Um, work on the projects that uh, we believe are going to be beneficial for the future of the town, as well as keep our schools well-funded and um, make sure that our students get good education because that's the bedrock of what communities are all about, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's an, in a nutshell what we're, up, what we're asking for. Trevor? Well, I would um, just like to talk a little bit about why we're here tonight. Um, to, and we felt we needed to do another information or, or an information um, session because, uh, I, you know, we had a special town meeting. I don't think there was one question on the borrowing. Um, and uh, there were some, a couple of, you know, no votes on it, but overwhelmingly it passed. Um, I think we didn't really, the select board failed in not getting the information out there clearly enough at how critical this borrowing authority is for the town. We, we don't have money set aside. We don't hold on to your tax money. Like, we don't hold $4 million aside to, to plan for an emergency like this. That would be irresponsible of us to be, to be taxing you that amount. So when we do have an, have an emergency like this, we need to come to the residents and say, look, we've had an emergency. We're asking for a borrowing. We're probably not going to borrow. I, I can guarantee we're not borrowing $5 million. A lot like when we did the sewer, we asked for a 19 or a, I think we finished a $22 million borrowing. We didn't borrow five years ago $22 million right away. We borrow a little at a time as we needed to pay our bills. So it's not like um, we're just going to go borrow $5 million and everybody's taxes are going to go up. That's not how it works. We're, municipalities are, are budgeted differently than your regular household income or your household budget. There are, there are laws in place and um, requirements that need to happen and time frames. Um, we don't feel like we did a good enough job explaining to the public why we needed a positive vote here. We don't have enough money in our budget to cut, you can see from the charts. We can't cut our way out of this. We need to physically, responsibly borrow 
and then pull money from capital stabilization, general stabilization, help from the state. We're going to pull all different forms of finance together. But when we asked for a borrowing, we asked for $5 million because we didn't know at the time what our total expenditures were. We looked at about 4.7 of expenditure. Um, we're going to be below that, which is great. Um, but when you ask for a borrowing, um, when you set up these questions, you have to pick a number. You don't know at the time exactly what that number is going to be, what you're truly going to borrow. But, but um, you know, you elect us to make those decisions and work with our financial team and um, a bond council and to try and come up with the most effective way to borrow money and to pay these bills. So. Um, the plan is that we ask for that authority. We're not going to borrow that amount. And generally, if we get all this figured out, we would probably rescind a certain amount of that borrowing, whatever we don't need to, at annual town meeting coming up. But there, for, for us in government, we have to ask for a certain number, gain your trust uh, to be able to look at that and study it over the months and figure out what we're going to get for help and then rescind that at the next annual town meeting. And it, because we can only ask certain amounts of times and then we only have so much time to be able to then run an election. We could have from, gen, you know, from, this, from the uh, special town meeting just got the vote and went and borrowed the money. But that's not fiscal responsible. We, we wanted to debt exclude the vote because we, we can't cut that amount of money from our operating budget in a year so we need to go out and borrow that. Um, and there is a, you know, a printout here that people can grab that talks about debt exclusion and why we do debt exclusion votes and how we budget things. Um, the whole idea is to stay here tonight and try and answer those questions that we've seen on social media or different, you know, it's, it's confusing. So people may have questions that they, they don't know how the budget works or they want to know why we borrow, why we ask, when we're going to borrow. Um, how, how it's going to affect their pocketbook. Um, we just wanted to stay here tonight to try and answer those questions and learn from you um, to try and get a positive vote here because I don't, I don't know another way out of this than to borrow what we need to pay this off over time like we've done with the school roof project, like we've done with the sewer, um, different other projects that we've had. Um, and there's not other projects. We can't go like, oh, we're not going to build the library now. We're going to go spend it on roads. We don't have that ability. When the residents vote for a specific project, that's what the money has to go for. The only monies that we have some pull on is our general stabilization and our capital stabilization. There's not a lot of money in there, maybe $1.4 million. Um, we also don't want to decimate that fund either because, you know, God forbid there's a tornado in, in February like Conway got hit a few years back and we have tons of trees and debris we need to clean up. We need to always have a little bit of money in stabilization to handle emergencies. So we'll probably pull from capital and general stabilization to help lessen the tax uh, burden when we, go to, uh, when we go to finance this all together, but we can't clean out that account completely and leave us vulnerable. So. I'll stop there. I could ramble forever, but I'm just curious about your questions and how we could try to answer those. Thank you. John. How big are your stabilization accounts? 1.4. Why don't you use a million dollars to subsidize it? We may. Use that as John, John. Come on up to the mic so everyone can hear you and then online. Just state your name and what you, yeah. So one of the reasons we use the mic is just not for people here, but when folks watch this in four days from now, when you're on the mic and it's recorded, they can hear your question and then they hear the full answer. Yes. Yep. All right, my name's John Pachurik. Thank you, John. Senior. <laughs> just for clarification. I was born first, so when I was born first, I was not a senior just then. <laughs> you are the junior. <laughs> My question is, how much do we have in stabilization? We have Last one, I knew, a couple of years ago, it was 1.2 million. 1.4. Why don't you take 1 million of that? We've been saving that for 25, 30 years, 20, 30 thousand dollars a year. If this is an emergency, I don't know what is. Yeah. You ought to take that and reduce that. We, we, will. we will. And if you turn around and get money from the state, you got to remember, the more richer that we look, the less they give us. <laughs> Well, and I've had that quite. conversation with senators and representatives for a long time that we kept talking about it. Does the 
state look at your financial picture, and they say, oh, no, we don't consider what you got in savings. Yeah, I believe that one like I... Well, they, they should. It makes sense, and, and yes... Well, we, that's fine that they look at it, but what I'm saying is you've got pockets of money, and when you look at all of our stabilization accounts and all our different saving accounts, I think last I knew we had six to eight million dollars. No. 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 We have 1.4 million in stabilization. In stabilization, but you add up all the other accounts that we have in There town. are no other accounts. There are none, John. Nothing. No, you have CPA. You have 4 million in CPA, but you're not allowed to spend it on this. That's right. But that's still money that the state looks at. Sure. So the, it, what I'm saying is if you got 4 million in CPA, then turn around and use what you do have available and that stabilization account. We will. Um, if I was on the Finance Committee still, I would recommend strongly that we use at least a million dollars and maybe even a little bit more. And depending on what you got for the state, I'd rather see you finance this thing for the short term over the next three to five years or seven years, but don't extend it out for 20 years because I no. won't be around to see it paid no. off. We never, we never, yeah, no. we would always use bands, which are uh, bond anticipation notes we've done for a lot of the projects, like the school roof was maybe a million and a half or something, and we, we, I, the finance team looked at it and said we could, and, and then with the changes in state government, you can do a ban for 10 years now and not just five. So you can do a ban anticipation notes. Your rates are usually lower and, um, or have been, and so we would do that. We would take from stabilization. We'll take from what we get from the state. We'll put all that together. We'll have to borrow some amount of money. We need that authorization to borrow, and then whatever, you know, shakes out in, in, in the spring, hopefully we'll have everything figured out in spring, we'll rescind the, rescind the, re, the rest. Because we don't want that borrowing out there on our, on our um, you know, if we have to borrow for anything, it affects your, your interest rates. So we want that number as low as possible. We just need the borrowing authority to have that flexibility to kind of work this out, get our best, best uh, budget foot forward, and then come back to you in the spring and say, we're going to rescind this much. We had to borrow this much, and here's where we are. We have to get through the winter. That's one of the concerns is what, how these impaired roads are going to make it through the winter. So that's why we have a question as what, what are we going to do? And then um, we have to go to town meeting. When we rescind, we'll have present a package where we rescind what borrowing authority we don't need. Um, and then we'll also propose to the town meeting, to, which takes two-thirds vote, to move the money out of stabilization towards payment of this. But it will be a combination, as, as Trevor has mentioned. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Margaret Nardowitz, um, 180 Stillwater. As Thank a resident you. of one of the roads that was heavily damaged in the July storms, the first thing I want to say is I cannot say thank you enough to the highway department. I, they, they came through. I saw Kevin, you know, evaluating one of the collapses in our road and I could see the exhaustion on his face and all I could say was thank you, you know, but I, I really do appreciate that. And I appreciate you having this, this forum. Um, I unfortunately or fortunately have become a member of a certain, you know, private social media group. Um, that I know administration has a hard time with as far as, as challenges on uh, facts versus, versus uh, fiction. But I have a few questions. Sure. Um, first of all, the list of roads that was shown um, that still need work, are they all town-owned roads or are some of them under private jurisdiction like, uh, what do we have, Rice's Ferry Road, Old Albany Road? They're all town. They're they are, okay, so they are under the jurisdiction of the town. Yeah. Has the town reached out to, and I know the stakeholders in those couple of places mm -hmm. would be some of our private educational institutions. Yes. Has, has the town already begun discussions with them regarding the extraordinary repairs yes. that are needed? That's awesome. Okay. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, has, and I, again, I appreciate the list of the roads. I appreciate the list of the culverts. Do these roads and culverts already appear on the town's capital improvement plan, or are they being added presently? They'll be added. They and will are be they, added this year. And there will be a prioritization of all the roads and culverts, right? That's, yeah, that's going to be Great really question. important um, because the hazard mitigation plan is fantastic, but then the capital, the capital plan really needs to be attended to every year. Yeah. 
Um, my next couple of questions are on financing, and I'm sorry, folks. No. Thank you all for coming great, out tonight. This is fantastic. Great questions. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, un, I'm still unclear as to how the town has paid its vendors for the emergency repairs. From what lines, from what funds, or was there a ban authorized? So w when an emergency like this happens, we reach out to DOR mm -hmm. um, and, and get authority to, to deficit spend. Department of Revenue. Oh, Department of and Revenue, that's thank under, you. And that's under Chapter 44, Section 31, yeah. right, for the emergency deficit Right, for the spending. emergency. And, and it's, it's similar to kind of how we deficit spend for, for um, snow and ice. Like, we, we, we put a budget out, hey, we're going to spend 193000 or something for snow and ice in a year, and we usually always overspend that, and then we come back to the residents, use free cash or leftover money or pull from somewhere to, to pay that difference. So when an emergency like this happens, because we have to make sure that we have ambulance service and fire um, apparatus being able to get to residents and, and businesses that... Um, this, the state allows us to deficit spend. So we have a budget, which we've borrowed from, you know, authorized from the town. So we have money coming in from taxes. Mm -hmm. So we pay that, we, we're approved to deficit spend that money, um, and we create a, a list of accounts, and we have uh, um, our accountant, uh, Brenda, makes a 2023 July storms uh, line. And then so all the spending gets paid for mm -hmm. out of that, um, so that's a big deficit number, and we pay those vendors with the tax money that comes in, then hoping we can come to the residents and say, you know, we have an emergency here, the, the town authorized that, that money, and then to debt exclude it, we need to then also go and do a ballot um, so that we can get it debt excluded, and that needs to be a, so a two-thirds, I think, here, or, um, or what is it, a negative here, is it? Two-thirds at town meeting. Two-thirds at town and meeting, and then majority. a simple majority. That's okay, where I, the ballot. That, that's okay. what I said. So, um, okay. so that, that's kind of how we're, where we're at right now. So we have, you know, it's, it's January, you've all paid your taxes, so we have, again, money coming in, but we, we will run out by the end yeah. of the year okay. without doing something. Thank you very much for that clarification, because mm. I know that's one of the things that's been going around on that, on, mm. on social media, uh, you know, what lines have been overdrawn, and, yeah. uh, you know, for example, the snow and ice line, uh, yep. you know, we know that that is, that is a line that can only be deficit spent for winter, that's, for winter purposes. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, I think that might do it for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Great you very questions. much. Yep. And for very those good. that don't know, Margaret was a town administrator and sharp yeah. as a tack. Yes, how can we yes. get you on a board yes. here? That's why she's citing <laughs> Mass General Law. I don't know how Casey does it. <laughs> <laughs> she's wonderful. Wonderful. Any other questions, please? Oh, great. Hi, I'm Mike Ruggles. Uh, moved here about four years ago. So uh, I'm just, I'm fairly new at, I'm very new at coming to these meetings, so sure. everything is new to me. I've learned a lot tonight about what happened during the storm. I appreciate uh, all the work that was done. I appreciate your explanation of, of the money that was spent and why. Um, looks like from, from the, uh, the graphs that you showed us, we've spent about half of the, the two point, roughly 2.3 million out of the 4.7. Yeah. About half of it's been uh, already earmarked for, for this, these projects. Yeah. So we, we basically have about half of it left, uh, as, I, as I see that. We, we, so it, 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 it has not been spent or co identified co correct. as it's been spent. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, there, so my question is, based on what you were showing us earlier that, uh, that we need to spend mm -hmm. uh, to, to fix uh, what, what needs to be fixed, uh, old stuff, uh, would the money, if we approve the 4.7 million, would the money then be used, the, the balance of whatever hasn't been spent, would that be used for the new projects that we need to be spent during the coming uh, fiscal year? Or would we have to come back and, and re-look re at this and redo the whole thing all over again? What, what happens generally in when you have these situations? It just, it's just that it was so overwhelming this time. But in general, in the last 20 years that I've been managing um, road emergencies, is you do an emergency repair, which is what our, our money has been spent on to open the roads and stabilize it hopefully through the winter, which is what our expenditures have been to date, to open the roads and hopefully stabilize the roads through the winter. 
you end up being entering a recovery period where you apply for grants for the remainder of the damage of the roads. Um, like Little Meadow Road that John brought up to the sewer plant has been undermined. It's, it's well over a million dollar project. We have already identified emergency watershed protection um, grant for that. Um, there is a match, but fortunately all the engineering and the permitting would be inclusive in the, the grant. We would apply for that grant in the next two or three years. The road will be repaired, hopefully. Um, Hawks Road, um, unfortunately because of the defeat of the original uh, debt exclusion question, we missed the uh, deadline for January. But what we were going to do in the Hawks Road was apply for technical assistance for the repair of Hawks Road. The idea was to make a decision whether we blast to upgrade the pipes or build the road up to, um, um, you know, take the extra water. We were going to apply to ecological um, um, restoration uh, division of mass um, for grants, technical assistance, in, and assuming that once we follow up on their recommendation that they would give us an implementation grant for the repair of Hawks Road. It's that kind of thing. Sometimes you have to, re you know, apply two or three years in a row. We had a mass works grant for River Road from Sunderland Bridge up to um, Dick Kalaszewski's house at 55 River Road, about a million dollars. We had to apply two years in a row, but we got that I think that was in 2014, no, no cost to the town. But that grant, Mass Works grant, would apply to a river road situation because it's a major um, artery north-south, you can evacuation, you can make your story up. But Hawks Road that has very few residents wouldn't be eligible for that kind of grant. So the idea is you match your grant to the road and over a period of three to five years, you're going to have the roads fixed by other means of non-taxpayer money. Just a, a, a follow-up. Um, so does that mean that uh, all of the uh, projects that uh, you identified, John, uh, that need to be done have not been really uh, financially looked at to see what we're talking about for that kind of money? Is that, has that got, is that step two to figure out what that would cost and then uh, uh, come back to us and let us know what we that would be? We have, we have approximately eight to ten million dollars worth of more damage that we hope to address with grants. Gotcha. Not Thank taxpayer. You. Not taxpayer. That's the normal recovery period for the next five, three to five years. In yeah, other words, it takes a while to fix them. The purpose of the borrowing that we're asking for authority to do is to do the emergency repairs that we've already done or we know we need to do by the end of the fiscal year. It's not to address the long-term problems with all of the roads in town. So it wouldn't be wise, in my estimation, to, to use the extra $2.5 million in the $5 million we're asking for authority to do long-term fixes. We need to approach federal and state to get as much money as we can to address issues on specific roads, as Carolyn mentions, and you know, not use the money borrowing from ourselves. You know, we, we need to maximize outside sources of money. This is only, again, the money that we're borrowing is only to address the emergency repairs that have already done to keep the roads open and stabilize them through the winter. So it probably it won't wind up at 4.7 of borrowing, you know, because we were able to manage to do a lot more um, for efficiently less. less, you know, but we didn't have all the permitting and all the bidding and stuff. We were able to do it, you know, we, we got a really good value for what we did. Again, I think John said it would be three times the cost of what we spent if we just decided, oh, we're going to go do all this work as a planned kind of thing. Um, so we really got great work. I mean, excellent. Uh, Cole Cost, Dan um, the other the other guys we've used are amazing, amazing contractors, did great work. So we got a good value. We just need to you know, again, uh, get back on our feet, pay the bills, get caught up, stretch out our, our finances so that we can, you know, not, not have a, a major hit to cuts to services that we, there's just not enough in our budgets to cut to get back on our feet. 
Tom Dot in 75 Graves Street. Uh, what, with all of this new capital, uh, mm -hmm. unexpected capital expenditures, what are the implications for existing capital projects that are going on mm -hmm. in terms of how you're going to sort of prioritize going forward here? And I just speak for I, I your mean, street. Not, yeah, <laughs> notwithstanding the realities that other people yep. are dealing with. I've been driving Grave Street for 28 years in its rugged form. Yeah. Uh, it's never been repaved. Uh, and I know yeah. we're in the midst of a project that seems to have stalled out. So just what are the implications around this issue going Do you forward? Want to hit for that? Existing yeah. thing. And then the second follow quick follow, any any tax rate implications that you're anticipating with this for future fiscal years? Great question. Thanks. Do you want to hit on the what the plans are for Graves well, and Cross? Um, I, I can I can hit on the plans right now for Eastern Graves and Cross. Um, we got uh, caught up. We we're trying to do it this year, and this year just didn't happen because of all the things that happened to us. Um, springtime bids going out, or actually bids going out very shortly for springtime. We are going to replace the sewer main on Cross Street, and from Cross Street west towards the mountain. Um, which is approximately another 600 feet. So a ball, ballpark about 1,000 feet is gonna be replaced there. Once that's done, then we're gonna go through, we're gonna completely mill the road, which is basically grind it up, take away two inches, and then put two inches back down. The reason why we didn't take care of graves and cross is because I'm cheap. <laughs> and I didn't wanna pay the extra $10,000 mobilization, demobilization twice. Um, do it all at once. I'm trying to be as cost effective as possible. This is not coming out of taxpayer money. As far as the paving and the milling, that is all chapter 90 money. And as far as the piping that's being replaced, that is all being done by sewer money. So once again, unless you're a user, you're not paying for it. So uh, that's another, uh, just a, a good uh, point to hit on is that we, um, you know, most of the paving and road work that we do is is done by Chapter 90. It's money we get from the state. You know, Kevin kind of looks at that. What, what are we going to do? Can we save up a couple of years and split it over projects over? A, that's how we did River Road, that big stretch this year um, or last lower year and, lower, and road. lower road. And uh, so we, we save up and use that money and don't come to the taxpayers to, to do um, road work normally. But this time, there's just no no way around it. We had we had to do this emergency repair. So, you know, again, uh, that's why we're asking for the help. So one one thing, Kevin, do you um, on a yearly basis? I mean, not counting the new the new Chapter 90 distribution that we're talking about. What is an average year of Chapter 90 money that you have to save several years in order to do a, a stretch of road? No, basically, we get somewhere around 325, 350 thousand a year. So, to give you an idea, when we paved River Road, it was 156 thousand dollars a mile. 156 thousand dollars a mile. River Road's 10 miles long. That's why I wasn't able to do all, I originally was trying to go as far as Pine Nook, the uh, cemetery. I had to chop it by almost a mile um, because we just couldn't afford it. Um, when I was done with that project, I had $22,000 left in our uh, uh, chapter 90. I always keep a little in there just for an emergency. And I know there's been a couple people have, have asked a question in case somebody hasn't thought about it yet. Chapter 90 money, I'm allowed to use Chapter 90 money, obviously, for roads, guardrails, and things like that. But I have to ask for permission first. So basically, the state hold, the, the district holds the money. I ask for it. I put in my paperwork. I say, this is what I'm going to do. These are all the different things I'm going to use it for. And then they come back and say yes or no. If they say yes, I move forward with a project. And then I put all of my paperwork together, and I hand it off to them. Now, if I have one bill that is in, or I've had any bills that are in there before the date that they say okay, they're not gonna pay for it. So I know there's been a few people have said, hey, you know, you've got like, you know, $300,000 worth of chapter 90 money, can you go ahead and utilize that? Well, I can't. I can utilize it for, for future, but I can't use it for anything that was been in the past. And to answer your question on the taxes, right? So um, the, I think, uh, Julie Chow Fund, our chair of the Finance Committee, had kind of put together a rough figure, and I, I, I don't know if I have it off the top of my head, like $173 um, that it would affect the average 178. That was if, if you borrowed. If, if we borrowed the whole $5 million and hit all at once years. for 20 years, but that we wouldn't 
quite do that. So it's hard to kind of nail down exactly what it would hit because we'll figure out how much we would borrow and then we would do bands and it depends on the rate and how many bands we take. And so it, it's hard to not give you an answer, but that, that's generally, if we did it all at once, it'd be about $178 for, you know, affect your taxes, but we wouldn't borrow that amount. Hey, Julie. Um, Julie Cavaco from North Hillside Road. Um, in the fall, we voted two thirds for the five million dollars, and because we voted for two thirds, I mean for five million dollars, this vote has to be for five million dollars. Even though we don't expect to spend five million dollars, we have to ask for five million dollars. Otherwise, we have to call another town meeting, and we have to have another two thirds, and we have to spend more money on this. It's all timing. Right. So exactly. as I see it, I believe you that you don't want to spend the full five million dollars, and I understand that we need to vote for this as it's written, and we can't make any changes on it. Otherwise, we won't um, be able to move forward at this time. Right. So that's a clarification I just wanted Thank to make. You. Thank you for making that. That's true. Yes, thank you, Julie. And it has to be done within 90 days of the town meeting vote. Yep. Yeah, that was another question that came up common. Why two votes? Uh, you know, we live in a world full of conspiracy theorists, so you know, there's been a lot of negativity being circulated around town. But the reality is, we get 90 days to, to hold a vote. The select board, obviously based on the special town meeting, where there was pretty much unanimous support for fixing the roads and allowing us to borrow the money to pay the bills. Okay. Can I have we had no reason to expect that people would not think that repairing roads was a fiscally responsible thing to do. So we were a little startled. Uh, and I think a lot of people who attended the meeting didn't turn out to vote because they figured, hey, this is perfectly logical. Why would we not vote yes? So we did a poor job of educating the community and we apologize for that. Uh, moving forward, we need a yes vote to give the town and the town's um, accountant and treasurer the ability to amortize this loan, whatever's left after we get state money, uh, over a period of years so that we don't have a big consequence on our tax rate. And the other, it's not a great benefit, but it is a benefit of doing a debt exclusion is it doesn't add to the bottom line of what your tax levy limit is in a year. So once this bill is paid off, it disappears. If you do it another way, you build it into the budget, it forms a higher base. And when, you're, when your taxes are readjusted the next year, they go up even higher because you have a higher base. Right. So yeah, once the bill's done, it's done. Those are things that are important to understand. And very similar to last, uh, you know, when, when we did the sewer vote, um, I, I, we lost that first vote as well. And I spent the summer, we all spent the summer and did, you know, show and tell tours at the sewer plant to get everybody to understand the need for why we did that. But very similar process. We, you know, we failed that first time. We know it was important. We had to do it. We were going for, for grants and loans from USDA. So we did informational sessions and then it passed overwhelmingly later that summer. So hopefully this will this will also have a positive out, out you know outlook for us. Um, I think you're all doing a fabulous job. I'm sorry, Dave Sharp, South Mill River Road. Thank you, David. Um, great presentation, um, but I think that you really should every five minutes say when the vote is. Because great it's point. Been about 90 minutes, and you haven't said that. And nothing's we have gonna, a vote next Tuesday. Nothing's going to happen if we don't get people out to vote. No, exactly. Oh, that's why you're always with us. Thank you. Yeah, next Tuesday, all day you can vote. I think it's is it 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. It's usually a town hall. Um, and it is on your handout in case. Uh, yep, but you're right. We'll mention it one more time before the end. Next and if you forget, it's on the flashing sign in the center of town. I already changed it. <laughs> Thank you. And the same thing at the transfer station. Tell your friends. <laughs> so if the select board be, would be so kind, can I have about 30 seconds? Sure. Okay. Sure. Then we'll have Good. So I just want to summarize very quick because we're bouncing around just a tad bit. There's no intent to spend $5 million. The $5 million came from my original budget and storm damage estimate before 
our legislators spearheaded statewide a $15 million bill. That $15 million bill for storm damages came from Representative Blay and Senator Comerford, who thankfully represent us because they're amazing. Woo! That is, the $5 million came from me, unfortunately. The intent currently, you've seen it right in front of you, this meeting is recorded, it is gonna be shared, it is gonna be put on the town website. The intent is emergency stabilization of the roads for the $2.4 million. When the state divides up at accounting and finance and we figure out how much we're getting back of the 2.4 million that we've actually spent, now the select board's in a decision-making mode with the finance committee as a joint team to go to annual town meeting and figure out where the additional money comes from and do we even need to borrow a penny. That conversation will transpire as soon as ANF, the accounting and finance at the state level, comes out with our permanent funding. With that said, Senator Comerford, Representative Blay, earlier today sent a letter to state accounting and finance advocating on behalf of the town of Deerfield as a rural community with a lower level budget with highly devastating storm damage numbers. And I thank Representative Blay and Senator Comerford for advocating for us at every single level. Mm -hmm. Thank Moving you. through my list, there's 250,000 left. We know we spent 2.1. We're focused on that 2.4, not 5. We asked town council, hey, special town meeting, we authorized 5 million. To Julie's point, can we reduce it on the ballot to just 3? Town council said, you can't do that. It's got to stay the original. We went crap. Okay, we'll leave it. So. We will look at additional money. We will look at restoring those other roads through other programs later on. The intent right now is to focus on the 2.4 million. The intent is to get the borrowing authorized next Tuesday, continue to stabilize our roads. And then once state accounting and finance gives us our number, we can work with the finance committee and select board and figure out where we can pool money from and hopefully borrow as extremely minimal as possible possible. Is that Tuesday the 16th, Chief? It is. Yes, it is. Thank you. I just want to say also that the money, the $15 million that John is referencing, was put in the end of fiscal 23 supplemental budget. That is the budget that ended June 30th. Natalie and Joe worked really hard to get a squeeze us in, even though the loss occurred in July, which is fiscal 24. When this distri distribution of the 15 million happens, it is my intention, which, I mean, hopefully it's, it would be enough, but if it's not enough, it's our intention as a select board to approach Natalie and Joe again and ask them to put us in the supplemental budget for the fiscal year, end of fiscal year 24. So at this time, next year, we will hopefully maybe have an additional funding source from the state. But again, who knows if, if we can do that and who knows if it's gonna happen and that's why we're asking for the borrowing authority. Pam. Pam Pradmore, 36 Graves Street. Welcome. First, I would like to thank you for having tonight's uh, program. It's very informative. Um, I've been trying to contact all of my neighbors as I see them thank to you. say, I don't care how you vote, just get there. Yeah. Just vote. Yep. Um, however, uh, I, I also want to say thank you very much to the DPW, especially mm -hmm. to you directly, Kevin, because um, 36 Grave Street, the culvert that was replaced under our street, um, handles the stream that goes through our property. Mm. Um, in 18 years, I've never seen our driveway flooded, and it did this year. Mm. Um, the street collapsed. It had to be closed. And, of course, the first thing I could think of was, thank goodness for Cross Street and Eastern Avenue, because at least the fire department or the police could get to us, the ambulance, should we need it. 
which unfortunately we have had to call. Um, so thank you to both of you especially for what you do for this town. Um, but that leads me to another question. So you've talked about if this passes on the 16th, this is what we're going to get, this is what's going to happen. What happens if it doesn't pass? Yeah. Thank you. Good question. We, I, I guess it, we, we don't really have a choice. So uh, we would come back at annual town meeting um, and say, here's where we are. Maybe by then we'll know what we got from the state. We'd have to do this all over again. We'd have another. We'd have another ask. It might be a. It'd probably be a different number at that point. But we would ask again, and then we'd have to do another election. All of that costs money, so it's expensive to do these. Um, so we we don't want to continue to keep doing it over and over. I think they voted on it four or five times for the elementary school when they had to do that. Um, but you know. It goes around and around, but we but we would have to come again and try again because we just don't have uh, there isn't money anywhere to cut you know to to get that to that number. Um, but we, we'd do everything we'd have to. I mean, we'd, we'll just keep working at it until we figure it out. But um, it, it's difficult. We'd rather do it smoothly, less stress for everybody, and just kind of finance it out so it's not such a huge hit on everybody. You'd have to let, I mean, the only way to do, to do, get that kind of cut is cut people and just constantly, and we, we run, our staff is amazing. They, they're so few and they work so hard um, at what they do and, and to try and lose those people, you know, for something like this, it just didn't make any sense. Again, cumulatively so. to come up with millions, several million dollars is just, I mean, it, it would really gut everything. I mean, we don't. Couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. Not at this time of the year. <clears throat> Bruce? Uh, Bruce St. Peter's uh, 19 Snow Snowberry Circle. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank everybody that has made the best effort that in this whole year. Thank you. And uh, unfortunately, the weather's getting more and more severe. And of course, we have another, we're in a zone of three to four inches Tonight. in the next couple days again. So who knows what's going to happen? But I guess a lot of it, from what I gather um, from the um, Facebook of in misinformation, is people really don't understand what's going on. This town has about a $17.5 million budget, and that's where everybody can think of is, well, we have $17.5 million to budget. As uh, Mr. Phil Hilchi said, we spend almost 70% on schools alone. So you take that, which comes out by my figures, around $11.7 million. So that leaves the town with $5.77 million to operate on. Of that $5.77 million, $3.9 million goes to payroll and benefits. $1.2 million of that number is just for benefits only. So what that leaves the town to operate on, if they only have personnel, forget the equipment or anything to do anything, is only $1.8 million. Now, the devastation you've already paid for is more than that. Somebody, maybe I had other, other alternatives, but at least I come down here and I try to vote, so I feel I have a right to speak. I'm sick of watching this Facebook kibitzing about rep replace the select board. Well, let me tell you, how many people how many times has there been competition amongst the select board? Everybody says they should do a better job. Well, step up and do it, okay? <laughs> Secondly, you hear these comments, well, the same 150 people go down and vote for everything, everything. We have about, I believe, around 3,800 voters in this town. So that means 150 people vote for, to vote something through. It means they can't get 151 people down here to vote against this property. It's the voters that raise their own taxes. And this is what people don't understand. They think that you decide you want more money, so you're going to raise taxes. The people in April decide how much they're going to raise their taxes come December when they get their tax bill. It is not something that comes out the back of a straw hat. 
And people need to understand there is a process. Yes, there is some money that the select board has to play with, but they don't have two and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. People accuse you of having the wrong priorities. There again, the people that come out and vote set the priorities. If you did not come out to vote, then you don't have a right to bitch about the people that did come out in mass for their own particular venue, venues. So I want people to understand that, look, it, it's not an open checkbook for the select board. They're governed by this. And from what I gather, and tell me if I'm wrong, what this gentleman tried to convey was, and I think it might have created a little bit of confusion, it sounds like you have paid for your vendors, which you have, mm -hmm. but Most. you have paid for it out of incoming taxpayer money, but you have been robbing the operating budget, and that's the part that I think is a little bit vague. Yes. So what's going to come up is you're basically Worst case scenario, you've got to shut the town down. Yeah. Okay? And that's what people need to understand. Maybe somebody had a bright idea, but nobody came forward with it. So this is what we're stuck with. This is the best judge judgment that was made in an emergency situation. We've got to get over it, vote to have this debt exclusion mm -hmm. gone through, and move on. And next time around, next town meeting, let's see 3,000 people instead of 300. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Here, here. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Call the question. <laughs> hey, does anyone have any more questions? Got one more. Sorry to, to bother you all. That's again, okay. Again, it's Mike Rose. Uh, I'm learning so much here. Great. Um, what I, echoing what this gentleman has just said. Uh, when I came here tonight, I was expecting you all were going to tell me we got to have $5 million. Mm. And that's because the only place I saw anything was on Facebook. Oh. And yeah. I, I don't know if there's something else I should be following or, or what I should be doing to get a better perspective on what we're trying to do. I appreciate what you all are telling me, and I appreciate the fact that I now understand what we had to do, but it's, it's much less than $5 million yeah. by, the, by the face of it. Yeah. And, and it, might be, it might be free. I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> but the fact is, it, it, it's, it's got a bad, uh, it, it's just being presented to everybody in town mm -hmm. wrongly. Yeah. Yes. So if we could just do a better job, and I've heard you all say you didn't communicate uh, the last vote uh, well. Right. Well, it's still got to be communicated, and I think it's got a good sound to it after you guys uh, explain right. it to us. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We so, want to we want to be absolutely clear that after the winter impacts, we will re be rescinding whatever we don't use, yep. and and long term we will be yeah, figuring me. out other ways to make matches or engineering for the grants that we intend, uh, intend to finish all the damage repairs. And just to uh, reiterate our plan for the, the few days that uh, are in between now and, and then the vote, we will be posting um, a recording of this, uh, a link to a recording of this for people so that they don't have to get the uh, information from a Facebook page. They'll be available on the police department's page, they'll be available on the town's page, and um, all of our comments will be included in this. The, the FCAT folks are going to put a YouTube together um, so that you can watch the video. We're also going to distill this PowerPoint dis a presentation that we had and turn it into a short video that you can watch in five or six minutes. Um, so that you can get all the information. It won't have Chief's wonderful explanations, but it will show the information and, and show the extent of the damage through photographs, and um, hopefully that will give people a, a better sense of what we were up against. And uh, finally, I'd like to say that, yes, if we are fortunate enough to get a million dollars from the state or more, um, that reduces the 2.4 that we've been speaking about to 1.4, and it gives us a lot more flexibility about how we borrow short term to manage this, this 
once in a, well, who knows? I, I'm not going to predict. Once in a week. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I came, I don't go on social media anymore because I, I came to understand that people thought that the select board had control of the weather. So I, I, I don't mean that. I was just like, boy, I wish I could. Um, but anyway, we will do a much better job of communicating. And, and again, we do apologize for that. The, and the last item is every other Wednesday, you're more than welcome to join us at select board meeting or just from Zoom if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, come join Rocky, Zoom. who comes to our meetings on every a day. Thank basis, you, Rocky. So. And then uh, finance committee starting up pretty quick on Monday nights, uh, so on the 22nd, uh, five o'clock. So um, every other Monday or every Monday, we'll be meeting to kind of the finance committee will be meeting to look at budgets for the next year. It's a great time to kind of get involved and see what's going on with your with your government and where you know where budgets are shaping up for 2025. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank, what did you say? Next, next Tuesday, the 16th. Thank 16. you. <laughs> Great. 10 to 8. Yep. And Town, Town Hall. Hall. Bruce. Yes, <laughs> yes Bruce. Uh, a couple other co uh, comments. Uh, one, um, the um, town meeting vote. There was a mention several years ago about going to a clicker situation. I mm -hmm. would almost bet you would have seen a different result had the clickers been there. Maybe. It's been ongoing year after year. People look around before they raise their hand because they don't want to offend their neighbors, their friends, or anything else if they think different. Mm -hmm. So they either don't raise their hand or they raise it. So if they don't raise their hand, you look around and it looks like it's unanimous. Mm -hmm. So you, it's one more thing that was supposed to have been looked in after that meeting, but it never got followed through. Okay. okay, and the other comment is, since we have so many people out here that know how to better run the town, there is an opening on the Finance Committee and there yes. is an opening on the Capital Improvement Committee. That's true. Yes. <laughs> yes, Thank indeed. You. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, I don't know if anyone else agrees, but um, there is weather outside, uh, and uh, I know it was slippery getting here, so if there's nothing else, uh, maybe we could bring this to a close. Any other questions or? Yeah, is there any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, really appreciate you coming out tonight, especially in this weather.